Well, um, so I basically, I hold, a, um, I hold to common sense morality, basically. So, I mean, the, the reason why I think there are problems with the state is not that I have, like, some weird alternative, really strong ethical claim like some, like some libertarians do. I think that the state is violating the ordinary principles of morality that we apply to everyone. Right? And I don't think that we need like some grand theory that tells you what's right in all circumstances. I think what we need is just, um, you know, there are certain situations in which you would say somebody acted wrongly. So if I go up to other people and I just like force them to give me their money, um, that's generally considered wrong. And it's not considered okay, even if I'm like, you know, then I give it to the poor, right? <laughs> like, I go and mug people on the street and then I send the money to Oxfam, which is, uh, you know, helping the poor. Um, that's generally not considered permissible, right? So, I mean, it's not, it's not really that I have a theory. It's just that I have the ethical reactions that normal people have and I just apply them to the state. And most people just don't apply the, the, the same moral norms to the state that they apply to everyone else. Well, so, you know, in my, in my book, in The Problem of Political Authority, there's a chapter that talks about kind of um, biases that people have. So uh, maybe, maybe the biggest thing is there's status quo bias, which is to say people are just biased in favor of the way that things are done in their own society presently. So, and, you know, this is shown in the fact that people in radically different cultures around the world regularly think that their culture is the best. Right? Think their society is the best and the way that they're doing things is the only right way and so on. Okay, now having a government is like a really central aspect of the way things are done in our society, right? We've really gotten used to it. So that's one of the reasons why people address bias in favor of the state. Uh, most people never question it, which is true of most of the norms of their society. Um, like you, you just say that about any of the things that we're doing. Um, even the things we're doing that are good, the reason why we think they're okay is not, not really you know, the real reason why it's good. It's just that's the way we're doing things. Um, you know, there are other things like, so this is more speculative, but I have a hypothesis that there's something like the Stockholm Syndrome. So this is a phenomenon where uh, if people get kidnapped by a, a criminal or a terrorist group or something, um, sometimes they start to kind of identify with the kidnapper. And uh, so if the kidnapper is, you know, like, so they're under the power of this person and the person is not completely abusive all the time, <laughs> like they show some mercy sometimes, then the people sort of start to bond with the kidnapper, okay? Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a theory that this is sort of a survival mechanism. Um, and, you know, maybe in our evolutionary history, people were very frequently under the power of other human beings. And the way to... Um, the way to succeed or you know not get destroyed <laughs> um, in that situation is to please the powerful right? please the people who have power and so what you do you just start and and you don't do that like intentionally consciously the way it works is your emotions just start adjusting to be what the powerful person would like right? so you just sort of start uh, sympathizing more with their perspective and yeah, so my hypothesis is, well, the state is just so powerful and, you know, people just have this instinct to kind of um, try to please, you know, try to sort of adopt the perspective of the people who are powerful. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, um, I, I sort of laugh because I think it's such a ridiculous theory, um, which I guess I shouldn't do because, you know, there are many people who believe that. but. Um, Okay, so yeah, so how did we opt in? All right, so we didn't actually explicitly say, nobody ever gave us a contract that said, hey, do you agree to a state and then we signed it? That didn't happen. Oh, so maybe we agreed implicitly. Okay, how did we do that? Um, okay, so one theory is we did that. So I think the most common theory that people have is we did that by just being in the land that the government controls. Okay, now there's, so there's some intuition behind this. So if I have somebody over at my house, I can impose conditions on their using my house. So I can say, hey, you know, um, you have to give me $5 if you stay in the house. And then if they just stay in the house, they don't have to say anything. They don't have to say, I agree. 
if they just stay there, then they have to give me five dollars. Okay, so yeah, maybe that's like the government, right? We're just in its territory, so we just have to do what they say. Um, the only problem with this is, um, you know, that only works if you are in your own property <laughs> and you're imposing conditions on the use of your property. It doesn't work if you're trying to impose conditions on the use of other people's property, right? So, you know, if you come to my house and then you tell me that I have to pay you $5 in order to stay in my own house, that doesn't work, right? And if I keep using my house, you can't say, aha, you stayed here, you agreed, okay. So then the question is, does, does the government own everything? Do they own all the land, all the property in the entire country? No, like they don't even claim that they own everything. Um, and if they did, like there's no basis for that claim. They didn't produce everything. You know, they're not using all the land, whatever. Um, okay. Uh, you might say, well, you know, maybe the government can just like declare themselves to be the owner. Um, I, like a maybe more plausible thing to say is, well, they're not exactly owners, but they have a right that's like, you know, not quite a property right because they don't get to sell it. They don't get to do all the things, but they have a thing called territorial sovereignty, which is sort of like a property right, but lesser. And, you know, it's compatible with somebody else having the real property right. Okay, but then the question is, so where did they get that? Where did they get the territorial sovereignty? And now you can't appeal to implicit consent to get that because you have to, like, because this thing, the claim of territorial sovereignty is needed in order to get the claim that we implicitly consented. Right? So there has to be an independent account of why the government has sovereignty or, you know, why they have rights over all of the land. Okay, that would be the account of the government's authority. Like if you have that, you don't need to say the stuff about consent because that's already the explanation of why government is legitimate, right? But of course, like, I mean, there isn't such an account, right? Like there, there isn't a good account of why the government has sovereignty over all of this land, right? Uh, no, so, um, yeah, okay. So, you know, here's, here's a theory of democracy. Uh, everybody voted for well, okay, so the people who appeal to democracy, um, usually they appear to have a simplistic view that like all of the laws are, that are passed are authorized by the people. So that to begin with is really questionable. Um, it's very possible to have laws that are not, um, not accepted by the majority of people. Uh, so obvious cases would be like in 2008 to nine, the, uh, the bailout of the big banks was very unpopular uh, among people among both Democrats and Republicans but you know, just the voters, not the politicians. It was popular among the politicians and they passed it anyway. Um, and that's just an illustration of the fact that, you know, however you want to account for why this happens, uh, laws do get passed that most people don't support. Okay. Second thing to say is, who cares if most people support it, right? So, you know, the question is, um, if a larger number of people want to do something that would otherwise be morally wrong, does it become morally permissible because there's a larger number of people who support it than are against it? So generally not, right? Like there's no other case in which you would say that. So, you know, there's five people in the room, four of them want to beat up the fifth person. They decide to take a vote on whether beating up the fifth person is okay. Only one person opposes it. No, I'm against beating me up, <laughs> okay? And then, oh, so now the four people can beat up the five because there, there were more of them, it's a majority rule. Okay, so nobody thinks that that um, makes it okay to be of the person. Nobody thinks that that suspends the person's rights. And you can just go through any, like any other circumstance that doesn't involve the government. You wouldn't say an action that was initially wrong becomes okay if a majority of people support it. You know, so, I mean, there are basically three, Three versions of social contract. There's like an, the explicit contract theory, the implicit contract theory, and the hypothetical contract theory. But the explicit contract theory might sound like a straw man, but it's not. So it's the theory that some people actually literally got together and said to each other, hey, let's establish a government. Like they literally explicitly agreed with each other, either writing it down or saying it in words. Um, that might sound like a straw man, nobody thinks that that really happened, but actually John Locke thought that that happened. <laughs> So he thought that with all of the cities, there was a time like when a, when a city was first founded, there was a time when the founders got together and uh, explicitly agreed that they were going to set up a government for their city. Okay, um, and then, so it was explicit for the first generation, then according to Locke, it's 
only implicit for the later generations, okay, because he's not totally stupid. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but the explicit contract theory, um, you know, that's basically not true. So, the, like, the governments that control, um, that control, you know, the land existing today, um, almost all of them got it by conquest or usurpation. Uh, this is discussed in David Hume's famous essay of the original contract. Um, so conquest meaning like well, a bunch of people sail from Europe over to this place that we're in now and they just kick the shit out of the people who are living there and take the land. And that's how we have control of the land, okay? Uh, usurpation is where, you know, there's a government and then somebody just like takes over the government by force. Like there's a military coup, they set up a new government. And so like... Uh, either of these things, like even if you believe the Lockean story about how government could become legitimate to begin with, in the actual history of every nation, there's some event of usurpation or conquest, which on Locke's view would make everything after it illegitimate. Um, okay, oh yeah, so that was the, sorry, the explicit contract theory, implicit contract theory we talked about. The hypothetical contract theory is a theory that, well, people would agree to set up a government this didn't actually happen because like, you weren't actually given a choice and there was already a government when you were born. But uh, if somebody asked you and if you were rational, you would have agreed to have a government, right? And then, so that makes it okay to impose a government on you. Okay, now there are some cases where um, a hypothetical agreement is valid. Uh, namely, it's valid if it's impossible to actually ask the person and uh, you have good reason to believe that they would, in fact, consent based upon their actual beliefs and values. So um, there's an accident victim who's been brought into the hospital and they're unconscious and you, you need consent to operate on them, but the person's unconscious. The doctors go ahead anyway. And the argument is, well, look, almost certainly this person would consent to be operated on because almost everyone values their life, <laughs> and et cetera. And almost everyone believes that, you know, doctors know what they're doing roughly, something like that. Okay, but it doesn't work if, first of all, you can ask the person and you just don't want to because you're afraid they're gonna say no. Okay, so then you cannot appeal to hypothetical consent. Secondly, uh, it doesn't work if you say, well, they would consent if they had different philosophical beliefs from their actual beliefs. So no, you can't do that, right? So, and that, that would be required for the hypothetical consent to the government. Um, because there are actual people, they're called anarchists, who we know would not consent. <laughs> then the only way that you can say they would consent is if you say, well, if they change their philosophical beliefs, then <laughs> they would consent to be statists, right? Um, okay, but that's not generally legitimate. So like if you have a patient who you know they wouldn't consent to be operated on, because like they've said that many times when they were conscious, you can't say, oh, they would consent. Um, also, if you have the patient and they're perfectly conscious and you just don't want to ask them, like that's not <laughs> legitimate. You can't say, I don't want to ask the patient because I'm afraid he might say no. So I'm just going to argue that he probably would say yes, or we're, we're just going to like gas him and then <laughs> do the operation. You can't do that, right? Okay, that's like the situation with the government. Why is the government not like, they could ask us. They could, like the IRS, when they send out your tax return, they could have a question on it that says, do you agree to the federal government of the United States? And then if you say no, then you could get a full refund of your taxes. I wonder why they're not doing that. And it's not because they already know everyone would agree. It's because they know too many people would not agree. <laughs> And then they would have to give back the money, and they don't want to give it back. Well, so my theory is that um, uh, basically law, most law should be common law, or all law should be common law. So, um, and the way that the common law would work is when people have some kind of dispute, they would come to um, a neutral third party to arbitrate it. And so, and this doesn't have to be the government. Um, so we can sort of like phase out the government courts by privatizing them. We can replace them with private courts, um, you know, competing private courts. Um, but so you go to the third party to have it arbitrated and the third party tries to um, resolve the dispute in accordance with how they understand the general norms of society. Okay, there are, um, there are norms in every society, whether or not they have a state. The norms don't have to come from the state. They're just traditions, and they're things that ordinary people understand as being right and wrong. 
So the arbitrator tries to decide in accordance with the, with the norms. And why would they do that? Um, from a sort of, um, like from a business standpoint, why would they do that? Um, the answer is that they want to have a reputation for being fair so that when there are two parties who are disagreeing about something, those two parties can still agree on going to this arbitrator, right? Because both parties have to think that this arbitrator is generally fair. And so that means that they have to decide in accordance with what most people in the society regard as fair, okay? Um, and then they write down the explanation for their decision. And then other arbitrators in future cases consult that. And that's the actual origin. I mean, something like that, except, you know, with government courts, is the actual origin of the common law, which used to be most of the law that we have. Right? Now, there are some things that you can't do that for. There are some laws um, that the common law won't work for. Um, but those laws generally shouldn't exist. Right? So there, there are laws that prohibit activities that no one would be complaining about. And so the common law wouldn't make those laws because like, you know, somebody has to bring a dispute. So somebody has to be complaining about your behavior in order for a judge to then, you know, just have an occasion to say, okay, you're wrong. Um, but you know, yeah, we shouldn't have those laws. So like um, prostitution, uh, typically there'd be nobody complaining about it as the prostitute and the customer wouldn't be complaining, you know, in the, unless like, the customer didn't pay, right? <laughs> but they wouldn't be complaining about the fact that the transaction happened. So, so there wouldn't be any laws against prostitution um, without the state, but I think that's, that's a good result. Well, um, uh, I'm not sure, right? Because I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that. But I mean, so, you know, one question is, does the state in fact protect the poor? Well, they're not doing a really good job. So, I mean, it might be true that we need the state to protect the poor, but also true that they won't do it, so they just won't get protected. Um, and there is, like, and I'm not just, like, saying that arbitrarily. Like, um, if you look at statistics on crime, uh, poor people are victimized a lot more than wealthy people. Why is that? So there's, I mean, there's more than one reason. It's not all the state's fault, but, I mean, one thing you can say is, well, the government's not doing a great job of protecting the poor. Um, one of the reasons is they probably don't care all that much. Um, why don't they care that much? Well, like, they're going to still be in power. Like, you know, even if there's a bunch of crime in the poor neighborhoods, that, like, the government still keeps going. They still get their money. Um, they're getting most of their money from the wealthy neighborhoods anyway, so, like, they don't care that much about protecting the poor neighborhoods. Uh, and the poor people don't have an alternative. Like, there's not an alternative protector that they could hire instead of the government because this is the whole concept of government. <laughs> the whole concept of government is that there's only one, where, like they have a monopoly and, okay. And so like part of the reason the poor are not getting very good protection is there's no competition because it's provided by the government, okay. Now, um, you know, you might think, well, maybe the poor need to be protected not just from ordinary criminals, but like, oh, they have to be protected from exploitation by the capitalist system or something like that. Uh, and there, I think, well, I mean, I don't, I don't believe in the theories of exploitation, so I don't think that hiring somebody to do a job and not paying them as much as they want, I don't think that's exploitative per se, if you're paying them the market wage, I don't think so. I mean, I think there's such a thing as exploitation, but I don't think if you're paying the market wage, then you're exploiting. Okay, but again, you can ask, well, but, you know, is the government going to do a better job? Like, you really think that they're doing a good job of, like, protecting the poor from whatever, from poverty? Um, you know, they're not doing that great. Um, so now the claim of, you know, we're narco capitalists is, well, the whole economy is going to be doing better if we reduce or eliminate, you know, all these uh, useless regulations that the government has or slowing down the economy. Uh, and then uh, the poor will probably be better off. Uh, it's not going to, so the stateless society is not going to come soon, I don't think. Um, you know, unless I'm badly misreading the country, because it appears to me that there are not very many anarchists. And I kind of think that um, a condition for the stateless society to come is that there would have to be a lot of people who believe in it. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, so, you know, suppose the government resigned, like everybody resigned, you know. Uh, Trump fires everyone, because, you know, he's really good at firing people. So Trump fires everyone and then he resigns. <laughs> uh, and Congress quits too, right? What would happen? 
Okay, immediately the next thing that would happen is people would start setting up a new government because almost everyone thinks that you need it, right? So somehow or other, they're gonna make it happen, okay? Um, I think it can happen eventually, but uh, there has to be sort of like, there have to be changes, you know, that are probably gonna take a while. Um, so, I mean, my story about how this might happen is uh, we could gradually downsize the government. So the government could gradually start outsourcing some of its responsibilities. Um, policing duties. They could start hiring private security guards instead of government police, which is done in a few places in, in the country, actually. Like, in a few places, the government actually hires private security because it's cheaper than their own police. <laughs> so, but that could be spread, and then, you know, police could shrink. Okay, we could do that with court cases also. So the government could start um, outsourcing resolution of disputes, like some lawsuits could start being referred to private arbitrators. Okay, now you can do this. There are private arbitrators and you can go to them, but we could expand the use of them. The government could start um, actually refusing cases and saying, only come to us if you can't get a private arbitrator. <laughs> They could do that, and then that could expand, and you know, eventually the government gets smaller and smaller, and eventually, maybe, people will realize, oh, we don't, we don't really need these people. They're not doing that much, right? Um, assuming everything goes well, as I predict, right?